Welcome to episode 35 with Tyler Cohen Wood, author of the book Catching the Catfishers, Disarm the Online Pretenders, Predators, and Perpetrators Who Are Out to Ruin Your Life. There are HR companies, as long as laws are allowing you to do it, that people will go out and they'll look at a person's social media page because sometimes people tend to be much more realistic about who they are on social media than they are in the real world. Sometimes not. Sometimes they try to make themselves cooler. But, you know, insurance companies too. If you're buying things that are beyond your means or you're hanging out with people who have bad credit, if you've made an insurance claim that, you know, maybe you have this problem, you know, they're going to be looking at different things. I see the IRS utilizing this type of technology. But the most important thing that we have to understand is this is stuff that we've chosen to put out. And we think that we're putting, you know, one post. That's not a big deal. But when you actually take the posts and look at them from the perspective that an HR person or someone else would look at, to gain insight into this, who this person is, you're going to find a lot of information about yourself that you may not even have known. And even things like, you know, say you never, ever talk about politics, but you like certain people's political things. Those are indications too. Hello, and you are listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. If you are listening for the first time, I interview leaders who inspire me in the areas of hardcore IT security, IT business leadership, innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, and fearless living principles. Welcome to the show. This episode is brought to you by the CIO Scoreboard. One of the toughest questions being asked of IT leaders today is, how are you doing with our information security program? Clearly communicating the answer to this important question can be difficult, especially if it's coming from the CEO, CFO, or a board member who is not technically savvy. Financial literacy is not the same as technical literacy. Financial skills are more ubiquitous and understood across business leaders than technical ones. So how do you do it? How do you clearly, transparently, and effectively communicate the state of your entire IT security program? The CIO scoreboard can help you explain the current state of it, your roadmap, gaps, and overall plan for your program in minutes by establishing a visual framework that all business leaders can understand, sort of like a balance sheet and an income statement for IT security. So go to visualcio.com to learn more today. Again, that's visualcio.com. Welcome back to the show, everybody. This is Bill Murphy, your host of the Red Zone podcast. Today, I talked with Tyler Cohen Wood. She's the author of the book, Catching the Catfishers, which teaches how to safely and successfully navigate the online world, protect yourself, your children, your privacy, and learn how to be sure if someone is who they claim to be online. Tyler has serious technical chops. She has over 16 years of highly technical experience and almost 13 years with the Department of Defense, where she served as Senior Intelligence Officer, Deputy Cyber Division Chief. And there's more. She also worked for the DOD's Cyber Crime Center as a Senior Digital Forensic Analyst, using her expertise to conduct intrusion and malware analysis that achieved many successful prosecutions. She recently joined Inspired eLearning as a cybersecurity advisor and media spokesperson. Additionally, Tyler's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, ABC, NBC, The Huffington Post, and in The Wall Street Journal. Some of the best learning opportunities from our conversation were the best protection is knowledge of how things work. Super cookies, zombie cookies, and flash cookies. The importance of turning off XF data on photos that are uploaded to social media sites. Reminding everybody about downloading applications, understanding what you're doing, and potentially giving away to companies, both yourself, your employees, and your children. 
How do others perceive you online? This has to deal with your personal brand. Have you researched yourself online and seen how others perceive you? Executive travel, posting your travel plans and work locations publicly, how to understand online deception and vetting people, and how to become a human lie detector with statement analysis techniques. Teaching your kids how to use a checklist to keep themselves safe online and a checklist to help with removing the emotion between educating children about online safety. As business leaders who want to be fluent on the impact of current privacy and security challenges, you'll find Tyler's message educational in both the personal, work, and family areas of your life. So it's now my pleasure to introduce to you my conversation with Tyler Cohen Wood. So Tyler, I want to welcome you to the show today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Well, I am super excited to have you because I read your book, Catching the Catfisher, and it was really, really interesting. And we're going to get into the details regarding that. But I wanted to explore a little bit about your quote from the book that I found really insightful is the best protection is knowledge of how things work. Yes. And I couldn't agree more. And I want, could you explain a little bit what you mean by that and knowing our audience and and about the people you're trying to help and serve, what does that mean to you? So what it means to me is I don't mean by any means that, you know, you have to become some coder or someone who understands the specifics and the ins and outs of everything, but to really think outside of the box and how something could potentially be a threat to you, your family, or your corporation. And you can really empower yourself. There's just a couple of like little things, a couple of things you can look at, you know, like permission settings on the applications that you use on your device, just a general knowledge of of how things work. And you don't have to be an expert, but that empowers you because then you can make decisions on if it's something that you want to use or not. You know, absolutely. And and I think this is a good reminder for people because most of the listeners are going to be technically savvy. And in many cases, many of them have getting, either have heard about this, what we're going to talk about, or are deeply familiar with it. But like the cobbler's son, and I'm not saying that right. What I is know. It's okay, though. You know what? I, I always say it wrong, too. I think it's the cobbler's son's shoes, feet go bare or something like something like that. I, I, I don't know. I always say it wrong, too. Thank you for bailing, you. bailing me out there. That's awesome because uh-huh. I, I feel like in many respects in our in the IT community that can happen with our with our children. And, you know, I know for myself, I, I see my kids come home and sometimes they flee to their bedrooms with their little iPads. And, you know, it's it's very uh, disempowering for you. you got to put on your adult parenting uh, cape and and go to figure out what's going on and, and how to rescue the situation. But I would be interested from your point of view, I'm starting to feel uncomfortable, really deeply uncomfortable about privacy and understanding the impact of like Spokio, a company like Spokio has in this interconnected world we live in. What what is your th- thoughts on privacy from a philosophical point of view? And, and do we even have any anymore? Well, um, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but um, in terms of personal privacy, we really don't have as much personal privacy as we did. It's it's just impossible. Even if you never go on social media or you never use a smartphone, or which I don't even think is possible, you still, there's other people posting things about you. You have a digital presence and, you know, that's just how it is now. And when you read the terms of service of the applications that you utilize, they typically will tell you what they're collecting, how they're collecting. And it's not necessarily a bad thing either. I mean, you know, some people say, oh my gosh, my privacy, my privacy, but it's not as if your social media company is specifically analyzing everything you do. You know, the intention there is to make things easier for you and to sell things for you. You know, I'll tell you a really quick story. 
So my husband and I used to be incredibly obsessed with the Cheesecake Factory. Um, <laughs> it's a good. It's a good restaurant. It's really good, and we would go every night, every weeknight at six o'clock. And every night I would pay with a particular credit card. I actually had the app on my phone, and suddenly. One day, we're passing the Cheesecake Factory at six o'clock, and the application we didn't go to Cheesecake Factory. We went elsewhere, and it pops up and it says, "Um, it's dinner time. Cheesecake Factory is so and so miles away." And I'm kind of like, "That's really scary." But then, on the other hand, when someone tried to steal my identity, it was the same company. That because they collect all this data, they knew and were able to say, you know, someone tried to open an account in your name. We closed it. We knew it wasn't you. It didn't fit your pattern. Well, first off, they thought you were a man, and you know, it just wasn't you. We know you. So there's good and there's bad to it too. But I think really, what we need to do is we need to kind of change our mindset. We we live in a world now where Privacy is just harder to come by. Yeah, and and I think part of the message, at least what I'm taking from your book, is yes, there's data aggregators, there's companies that focus on grabbing as much information about you that is possible, and companies like Spokio and others that are pulling this all together, using big data and using these powerful tools. To understand things about us, and then selling it, and then of course we're all worried about securing our own enterprises when really should be trying to secure them as much as anything because they have so much information. But that's almost like a it's beyond philosophy. It's at a national level of it's almost beyond our control. It's with it's at a po- political level in, in many respects. But your book is about what we can do individually, right, to take well, control. And I'm not going to, by any means, pretend to be a lawyer or to really understand the new EU regulation that just came down. You know, that's it's going to be interesting to see what happens and how companies can work around data. And I've seen a bunch of articles saying, you know, how you can still maintain data, still u- utilizing the EU privacy laws, but. It's going to be interesting. There's going to be a lot of interesting things that are going to come up in the next couple of years with how this, how privacy is dealt with. So one of the pieces that I found interesting was you're you're talking about the photos and and, and just looking at a, at a phone, for example, from just a practical point of view. What do you think are some takeaways for our listeners about what they can immediately do with themselves and their kids regarding photos in their phones and privacy settings? Well, your very technical listeners, are they're going to be like, oh, no, now she's talking about EXIF data. So EXIF data is data that's taken with, unless you turn it off, with every modern camera, including your smartphones. And what it does is it actually, it does a lot of things, but one of the most important things is it pinpoints the exact geographic location of where the photograph was taken. So it helps to build a pattern of life. Some social media sites will strip it out so it can't be downloaded, some don't. And it's extremely important because one of the things, when when you're dealing with a predator who is potentially after your child, you want to make sure that you're not giving away too much information about your child And you want to make sure your child is also not giving away too much information from you. Because unfortunately, you know, the bad guys are are pretty good at what they do. And they can hide behind their, their computer wall and they can really build some pretty strong personas. Now, fortunately, we teach you how to vet if they're realistic or not later on in life. But, you know, that's just kind of one thing that we have to deal with. But it's something that you can turn off as well. So you can turn it off in, so that none of your photos that you upload will have this uh, EXIF data in it. And that could be a, something you could teach, make sure you have turned off yourself, but also your children. Yes. Excellent. Yes. What about apps that are downloaded and that are always constantly asking for, or not always, but many of them ask for location aware? Is this a case where we just get overwhelmed by it or, or do we just decide to expose our location to these multitude of apps, not only on our phones, but our, but our children's phones? <laughs> Well, see, this is a really tough question because, again, knowledge is going to be empowerment. So 
understanding what you're doing, not at a bits and bytes level, but understanding what you could potentially be giving away to this company. You know, it's one thing to be giving information to, you know, a foreign flashlight company versus a social media company based in the United States that's basically just collect, kind of collecting your data to be able to sell you things. And by knowing this types, these types of stuff, you can make decisions on whether or not you want to be able to use it. And some of these applications, you know, you really have to think about. You know, like, for example, um, I think I even talk about this one in the book. You know, if I have an emergency Starbucks craving and I'm in a place where I don't know and they ask to use my location services, well, which is more important to me? Starbucks collecting my location data or getting my Starbucks? And, <laughs> you know, I'm going to tell you right now it's getting my Starbucks. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> What about this? I found it was interesting, you know, being in the profession, but I, I the concept of cookies, I, you gave an example of, I think it was when you either, it was uh, from a colleague of yours, a previous colleague or yourself, it was a predator that thought that that he thought or she thought that they were obscuring their identity through proxy systems and such. And however, you found them, I guess my, my ultimate question is, can you explain what super cookies, flash cookies and zombie cookies are? for browsers, browsers and phones, browsers and in, in tablets, et cetera. And maybe just explain how potentially you really aren't going to get rid of all these pieces, which makes it very hard to be anonymous. No, you're not. You know, back in the old days, you know, a couple of years back, we'd have cookies and they resided in a file and they had a, a format. You could delete the cookies. They remained in a location and they would basically help us. We wanted to auto log into a site or we didn't want our session to end we could utilize these cookies but now different companies are getting much smarter and they're putting in these kind of zombie cookies that are not necessarily going to always be in the same place so they're going to be harder for you to remove and again the majority of the reason that these things are done are to find out more about you to sell you stuff so here's an example, you know, you're going to a website and you're talking on email or something like that, or you're talking to a friend about how you've got to find the exact perfect gift, wedding gift, and you need this and this and this, and you don't even know where to begin to look, what's perfect. And all of a sudden you start getting emails with that gift. Well, mm -hmm. for someone like me, I'm like, damn, nice. Now I don't have to go searching for it. But other people might be very upset about that type of stuff. And you're really not going to get rid of those cookies. I mean, there are some things that you can do to kind of protect yourself a little bit if, if you really are very, very privacy oriented and... For example, you don't use the applications as much. You always go to the website, but you're still going to be putting cookies in, in some type of location. And sometimes you can find the super cookies. Sometimes they're polymorphic. And again, this technology is building and getting better and better and better even as we talk. So what we're... What and, and I found this kind of dovetails kind of with the, some points you made about that our, our insurance companies, health companies are actually looking at our combination of likes on our, like Facebook, for example, and Twitter followers. And they're sort of building these profiles about us with automated tools, which again, your book and your message is about here's the facts, but then here's what we can do about it. And I know we haven't gone to the, gotten to the part where we can do about it, but maybe we could just talk about how these very powerful tools are actually building up a, a story about us online. It's a story about us online. That's exactly what it is. That's the best way to put it. And there are HR companies, as long as laws are allowing you to do it, that people will go out and they'll look at a person's social media page because sometimes people tend to be much more realistic about who they are on social media than they are in the real world. Sometimes not. Sometimes they try to make themselves cooler, but, you know, insurance companies too. If you're buying things that are beyond your means or you're hanging out with people who have bad credit, if you've made an insurance claim that, you know, maybe you have this problem, you know, they're going to be looking at different things. 
I see the IRS utilizing this type of technology. But the most important thing that we have to understand is this is stuff that we've chosen to put out. And we think that we're putting, you know, one post. That's not a big deal. But when you actually take the posts and look at them from the perspective that an HR person or someone else would look at to gain insight into this, who this person is, you're going to find a lot of information about yourself that you may not even have known. And even things like, you know, say you never, ever talk about politics, but you like certain people's political things. Those are indications too. So there's a lot of information out there that can be very easily pieced together to determine, you know, who we are as people. So let's talk about some things that we can do, Tyler, to at least take back control or assert some sovereignty over this individually and with our families. And maybe we can start with individually first if we're a corporate executive. How would we start piecing together? I guess one of your pieces is what what does the other world think about me or what would a an observer think about my presence online? Is that one question to ask? That's definitely a question to ask. Yes. You want to go through your social media and you want to see how someone else is going to perceive you. You want to research yourself online because you may have the best privacy settings in the entire world. However, sometimes privacy settings change and you may have something called a friend collector. And these are people who will just friend anybody just to get their numbers up. And sometimes friends of friends have the ability to read your posts. So you may be the target and they may just get to you through the, the friend finder. And you don't want to be a Stepford version of yourself. Like you don't want to be too weird and freaky or never post because then that's not really your personality. But you also want to really think, is this something that I would want to follow myself around for the rest of my life, especially if you're a child? Do I want college boards reviewing this? Do I want future employers potentially seeing this? You know, do I want current employers potentially seeing this? You know, is this something that I would go to a party and shout out to a bunch of strangers? And you really want to look at it that way. You know, I had a friend who I don't think she had a drinking problem. I, I don't know. I mean, I haven't talked to her in a while. But, you know, she was constantly posting on an almost daily basis about, oh, I need a drink. Oh, I need a drink. Oh, I need a drink. And if you're looking at that, what does that make you think? Maybe this person has a problem. Uh -huh. Regardless of that, if it's true or not. It's a perception, and the perception becomes reality. So you're not saying people need to be paranoid. Just be aware of essentially your individual brand. I mean, and I hate to make that too corporate, but really it's right. almost like if you're engaged with someone in a one-on-one -on -one basis, would you have this, that same conversation with that one-on-one -on -one person as if you were online? Or maybe almost offering people a governor valve to what they're actually placing online. So you had some, some suggestions for people when they're posting photos about their children and about specifics of like how their children are, are doing, maybe could you share us a little bit of guidance on, on that regarding um, children and what you're posting about them? Absolutely. Privacy settings, remember this, if you remember nothing else, privacy settings can do and will change. And if you're posting something that you think is just private to a group of friends, like, oh, Johnny just got cheating again, someday that may be available to recruiters. Someday that information may be available to college boards. So you just kind of want to be careful. And if you want to have a private group, you know, set up a private group. And if you want to talk to a friend, you know, about this privately, there's also this old-fashioned thing called the telephone. <laughs> 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 but you you just want to be careful. You but then again, you also don't want to have these stepford versions of yourself where everything in life is perfect because everyone knows that's not true. And if you put down, yeah, I need a drink tonight, you know, a couple of times, whatever. That's fine. But if you're doing stuff like that every night 
or you know if you're an executive and you're constantly talking about your travel plans or you're working from home tonight it's very easy to find your address or oh going to Starbucks again to go work you know it's very easy to set up things like um, rogue base stations or you know, man in the middle attacks targeting, you know, MZ catchers actually targeting that particular person. And you could have the best security on your device. There's the potential if they're using this a rogue base station, they've got their signal the highest, you turn up to be connecting to it. They can put updates on your phone or your device, meaning malware that gives them control of that device. So, you know, these are things that you just want to be cognizant about, the things that you say. But you, if you're proud of a vacation, talk about it. What was the malware you said? What was the example you gave? You had a name for it? The Rogue Base Station. Rogue Base Station. Got it. Okay. They also call them MZ Catcher, Stingray. There's some other, other name to you. Basically, what this is, is they're, they're pretty easy to build or buy now. Pretty cheap, too. So, it's a, a base station that you put in like a Starbucks or whatever. And basically your phone is going to work. It's going to connect to the strongest signal that matches, you know, AT&T. And if you have this rogue base station set up and it looks just like the real AT&T, obviously the signal is going to be closer to your phone. It's going to be stronger. And you're going to start going through that base station instead of, AT&T's real base station. Now there are tools out there now that say, I haven't tested them yet, that say they can help you, but you also could notice things like suddenly you had one bar and now you have five mm. and you didn't do anything. So, you know, these are kind of the things that it all put pieces together. You know, the, the attacks can come from people learning what your pattern of life is. So, Tyler, you had this very interesting career that led you to the Department of Defense in the intelligence agency. And yeah. I was wondering if you could just tell a little bit to our listeners about how you got started. And you can go back as far as you feel is relevant. But I, I'd really like to know <laughs> where you developed this, this interest and these skills and how you were shown this path. Okay. Well, I was born in... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was in college, not to age me, but um, didn't really have too many computer science degrees. So I was sociology, criminology, and, and history for some reason, and psychology. I could have done three. I had enough credits, but they only allowed two double majors. But oh, wow. I decided, you know, people told me, well, you can't do this computer thing. You know, you, you just can't. You don't have the math background and blah, blah, blah. And I happened to find... My calling at the same time, which was to actually be a rock star. <laughs> However, I believe that anyone can do anything that they set their mind to with one caveat. You have to kind of have a little talent. <laughs> and if you can't sing, it's just not going to work. <laughs> no, so I worked for radio stations and then got into computers and then moved in 1999 to San Francisco and just started um, learning everything I could about computers, started working in the computer industry. And then 13 years ago, uh, moved to uh, Washington, D.C., where I started working for the Department of Defense and started working for federal law enforcement. And really, that was so important to me. Um, the intrusion cases were fun, but the major crimes cases, and those are the cases where you're dealing with a victim, with the actual person, those were the ones that I was very, very involved with and very invested in. And then I moved to the Defense Intelligence Agency for almost six years, kind of kept moving up in the ranks, not financially, um, <laughs> <laughs> government, you know, and at the same time, had recently written this book for various reasons and started doing the PR around it and realized that I actually loved it and I loved doing the interviews. I love speaking to people. I cared very much about it. And that's kind of what I wanted to move into next. And that's 
why I went to the job that I'm at now as been there two months now, I think. So catching the catfisher, uh, I actually was dying to know how you got the title. And, and then I finally got to page 206. And I think I figured out the title. Maybe you can explain for people, what does that mean, catching the catfisher? And what are you trying to accomplish with the book? What's the primary purpose of it? The primary purpose of the book is to teach people how to understand this Wild West domain and use it in the best way possible by empowering themselves in ways that are easy to understand, but also do, do two things that haven't really been done before. And that's in a very easy to way, way to understand, to learn to read deception in the online domain to protect yourself and your children, and to vet if who you or your children are talking to online is actually who they say they are. And, you know, it all kind of started from, you know, a story from a former agent that I used to work with when I was at the Department of Defense Cybercrime Center before DIA, where he told me just this dreadful story about a suspected pedophile who was caught for something that was related to, to him sending photographs. And the forensic investigator was doing the review and he saw he was having all these chat sessions with a supposed 11 year old girl and he knew everything about her, everything. She was having a fight with the Kim at school, brother problem, like everything. He knew exactly where she'd go to dance class every Saturday, everything. And he convinced her he knew her. So 40, 45, 47-year-old man. He told her he was a 13-year-old. Fortunately, they never met because he was caught for something else. And the examiner couldn't understand how he knew all this stuff about her because apparently she didn't really have much of a social media presence and it turns out the guy was going to the mother's dating sites all of she had so much social media some that did contain exit data and she was constantly talking about her daughter on these sites and you know I'm sure she would have been horrified to realize that she had potentially put her daughter at risk and I said to the agent, I said, is there a book or something easy that can help people like with this, something they can read quickly and, and go over with their kids? And he said, I don't know, look for it. So I did and I couldn't find it. And so I wrote it. Well, I, if you saw my notes here, they're strewn all over this huge piece of paper and, and these big post-it notes. And I wrote in particular the deception I think there's some value in this book just purely from either understanding deception and understanding becoming a human lie detector. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in this new world where we have a lot of online, we're don't, not always talking to people, especially maybe you can go through the generational differences and where the age breaks are. But that can you explain maybe what the top deception technique is one of your favorite that you could tell the, our listeners about? Sure. So when you're in the real world, and people have done studies. There's so many wonderful books on it, on reading deception through body language, because the majority of our communication is through body language. But in the online world, you know, we just don't have it. So there are techniques. There's a law enforcement technique called statement analysis that I kind of modified. And it's where you go through the words and you, you figure out where the lies begin and where the lies end based on utilizing these techniques. And some of the really neat ones are, you know, not taking responsibility for what's being said, you know, leaving out details. My favorite one is one that I haven't really heard used too much, but that's the one about time, where the brain, if you're telling a story from memory, the brain is telling the story from a certain place in memory and it will use past tense words. But if all of a sudden the story, the person starts using present tense words, that's an indication that that could be where the story's changed and it's not real anymore because they're seeing it as they're saying it to you. And the example that I used was, wasn't great because it's not one that's used all that often, but you know, the, the deception techniques are hugely important for, you know, HR professionals, for for really anybody. Yeah, it's almost too many. You give too many examples probably to, 
to go into a lot of them in, in a huge amount of detail, but definitely yeah. that tense hopping is one. But the other one, uh, like simple, like an employee says, will you, will you help me get this promotion by giving me a good recommendation? And then the oh. boss says, this sounds like such a great opportunity for you. You would definitely do a great job in that position. Yep. Never really answering the question, distraction and not answering the question. That's something to always look out for because if someone is lying or they're doing exactly the opposite of what you think they're doing, they're not going to tell you because they don't want to. So that that's I'm really glad that you brought that one up because are you going to help me with this promotion? You would be so good at this promotion. And I got so excited. And you know what? I thought that was a yes. And then going back after learning about this, you know, I really he yes had never been stated ever. Well, the checklist that you give right after those deception techniques, I think is is one of the, the main wins from this book is yeah. what everybody can just take this checklist and kind of run through it with their children and really make sure that that and, and it's a way of engaging the kids instead of the emotion of you know, why are you why are you looking at my phone and all my all my things well you can actually involve them in a in a really a checklist to kind of make it more logical instead of emotional approach to this topic absolutely i mean i when i was working on this there was a a friend of mine with a little 16 year old daughter and um, <clears throat> she'd been talking to someone online and he said, I know you're working on this thing. Hey, can we go through some of these checklists? Cause she had a good rapport with her father and they had started this rapport, you know, when she first got her cell phones and, and all this. And we went through some of the items in the checklist, even some of the, the first items and will you have a Skype conversation with me or a telephone conversation? No. You know, will you send me a photo in real time? Uh, no, I can't do it. We took the photograph that he had sent her and he was supposed to be from one place, but the EXIF data was still in the photograph and it showed him in another place. He didn't have the right geographic details about where he was supposed to be. And he also didn't have the right pattern of, of digital breadcrumbs that he should have had for a 16, 17 year old boy. He didn't have many friends, much social media. His, he was never tagged in anything. There was mm. no regular banter. So what's an example oh, of a real time photo? Would that be like Vine or just uh, how would you know if it's coming real time uh, a photo? Because I say, Bill, send me this photo. So send me a photo of you right now. Oh, got it. So it's boom. It's done real time. Okay, got yeah. it. That makes sense. Yeah. Send me a photo of what your, your dog is doing right now. And if, you know, you're constantly making excuses as to why you can't or won't, well, that's weird. Is it possible to use browsers like uh, DuckDuckGo or some of these anonymous browsers as a part of taking back some amount of control over over your browsing or is it better to something like a, a chrome or an ie because of the the add-on security layers with it what, what are your thoughts on that i mean i think it's it's whichever you feel more comfortable with i i personally use chrome because i like the added on security features but it just depends on you know what what you want to use sure and what about like some of the instant messaging and some of the, the communication programs like Cyberdust, would you at all be concerned about having some of those IMs held in cash at all? Or do you not really care about that? You just are more more concerned about the context of messaging versus the transport of messaging? Well, I mean, I'm concerned with all of it. Cyberdust is one that disappears, right? Yeah, that's that one with um, Cuban. Mark Cuban yeah. um, has developed it. It's, yeah. I, again, I don't know of the technical reality. I know that's what they're marketing it as. If if it's traversing through, the packets are traversing through a network and the network is, is keeping those packets, it can always be reconstituted. And never forget there are low-tech solutions to high-tech issues. Someone could take a photograph of whatever it was you sent and sent that around. So you're not as safe with that stuff as you may think you are. Sure. Yep. And, and I haven't really analyzed Cyberdust, so I don't know. Maybe there's lots of levels of encryption. So I don't know. Yeah, I guess it's more of a philosophical question about, you know, just the, the using communications. Because 
ultimately, it seems like the way we're going is that f- all phone messages are going to be, I mean, this might take a couple years, but it looks like that most of our communications are going to be searchable in some way, shape, or form, probably even down to phone at some point. So it's almost like we almost have to, as a society, just be really uh, just very aware of what we're putting out there because, yep. we're, I mean, who knows where this is going to be 5, 10, 15 years from now. Not at all. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you saw in the book the rules that I have, the posting rules. You know, and and I like it. If you wouldn't say it to a big crowded room and you don't want it to follow you around the rest of your life, don't post it. So as we as we wrap up here, Tyler, what is a good what kind of a message do you do you want to leave with my listeners as far as the book is concerned and what you want people to know regarding the issues that you've discussed in the book? Well, it doesn't have to be scary. I don't want people to read this and be like, oh, my gosh, this is so scary, because it isn't. As long as you have kind of a general understanding and you work with your children and you're, you know, you're honest, you're open and you go through some of the things that that are in the book and you learn some of these techniques, then you're putting yourself in a position where you can make decisions. You're empowered. You can use things or not use things based on those decisions, you know, but at the same time, you know, the way that we deal with privacy and view privacy kind of has to change. And that affects us personally and professionally. Well, and I thought that was interesting and being aware of your, of one's image, because I often find that sometimes the folks that are leaders in the IT, they're, they're, and you wrote about this extensively about how you're perceived with what you're you're putting out there. Like I've suggested to some of the IT leaders that they should be blogging, they should be talking about being a thought leader in their arena, mm-hmm. and you know, and, and being aware of your style. Like I, you had talked about, are you a one upper style or are you an uh, arrogant boundary yes. crosser style? Like, what is the style of communication? Maybe you can just mention that just from because that impacts people professionally. Of course, it does. I mean, the best advice, because I talked to a lot, I had a lot of HR people helping me with this. And and the best thing that you can do is just, you know, be yourself. And in some professions, one of them pointed out, hey, in some professions, it's good to be a one-upper because it means you'd be an incredible trial lawyer. <laughs> I didn't put that in the book, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, you know, really just just just. Be yourself, but, you know, be, be careful too with the, the things that you're posting and, and that you're saying and research yourself. Look at yourself like someone else would. And if there's things you don't like, change them. Well, I want to thank you for your time talking with my listeners, Tyler. And, and I wanted to just wrap this up. Is there anything that else that you want to mention that, that I haven't mentioned in, the, in our conversation that, that uh, you wanted to wrap up with? Sure. You know, if there's something that you want to do, don't let anybody tell you, regardless of of your gender, your race, your intelligence, whatever. If someone tells you that you can't do something and it's something that you know is right, go for it because you can do it. And and I do believe that very strongly. And if there's if you have a dream and there's something you really want to go for, don't let anyone tell you that you can't do it. Go for it. That's a that's a powerful message, Tyler, and I, I I appreciate you for that. And if people wanted to learn more, kind of about you and and, and your writing and 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 uh, where where would they what would be the best place for people to reach out to you? Uh, LinkedIn is good. Um, I'm on Twitter. I have a website, but I haven't updated it. I haven't had time in in a long time. But Tyler Cohen Wood. On Facebook, Tyler Cohen Wood on LinkedIn, at Tyler Cohen Wood on Twitter. And th- those are really the, the best the best ways to get me. But if you want to be my Facebook friend, uh, it, you'll be inundated with dog and horse pictures. So, <laughs> so, so on, I recommend the, LinkedIn or, or uh, <laughs> on Twitter. If that makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> and I'll put show notes for all these so they'll have access to, to the book to get a link to to purchase that. And also I'll have links to, you know, your profile on LinkedIn and Twitter. So I want to, I want to thank you for your time today, Tyler. So this wraps up episode number 35 with Tyler Cohen Wood. I want to thank you for listening. If you've made it this far in the program, I'm super appreciative. 
The number of our listeners is growing exponentially, which I'm really excited about, but I'd love to hear from you. So go to Twitter, and my Twitter address is at the Red Zone CIO. That's at the Red Zone CIO. Or you can find me on LinkedIn under Bill Murphy in the DC area, or on iTunes. You can go right on your phone if you're a iPhone user, and you can just click on the show image, and the show image will open up to all the show notes right there, and you can click on how to leave feedback on iTunes. You can leave feedback on Stitcher. You can leave feedback on SoundCloud as well. If you want to find more about Tyler, if you want to buy our book, view resources we discussed in the show, go to the show notes at the redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. Again, that's redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. And until next time, have a great day. So there you have it. This wraps another episode of Bill Murphy's Red Zone Podcast. To get all the relevant show notes, please go to our blog at www.redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. Additionally, make sure you go to iTunes and leave your comments in iTunes about the show. This helps our show rankings enormously and it helps support the show. Until next time, I appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you.